Welcome to the final session of the forum. Uh, we have exactly the same format as we did yesterday afternoon. Four student speakers, 10 minutes each, followed by 20 minutes of uh, group discussion, 20 minutes or so of group discussion. And our first speaker is Arash Akbar, who's going to be talking about representational art and the artist's role in criticizing society in Nietzsche's philosophy. So, Arash. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. In this presentation, I want to talk about the reasons that Nietzsche accepts the representational art like a sculpture, but rejects metaphysical or non-representational one, like music. Also, I want to talk about the role of art. I want to talk about the role of art and artists in the society according to the second phase of Nietzsche's philosophy, theorized in the notable books, Human, All Too Human, and Thus Spoke Zarathustra. I will divide my presentation into two sections. The contrast between science and non-representational art and representational art as a model of morality. I aim to answer these questions. What are the reasons that Nietzsche doesn't accept non-representational art? What is the role of rep representational art and the artist in criticizing society? Human All Too Human is sub subtitled A Book for Free Spirits. Nietzsche believes that freedom from metaphysics, religion, and art is significantly important. He believes that freedom is possible through science. Art, religion, and metaphysics belong to a primitive human, and they are against science. He says, what we value now are not the grand errors handed down by metaphysical and artistic ages of men, but the small truths we discovered by thinking of which earlier ages were incapable. As it's clear, the main target for criticism in his work, Human All Too Human, is denying the metaphysical world. He believes that through science, we are getting closer and closer to the knowledge of true nature of the world. As a result, he believes in scientific realism. Besides, in the scientific perspective, the world has a dynamic character, not mechanical. He says, everything has become. There are no eternal facts. So Nietzsche rejects, so Nietzsche rejects the supernatural world that is beyond space and time. We can say that Naturalism is a fundamental assertion in human, all too human. He says, where you see ideal things, I see what is human, all too human. The world of metaphysics is affirmed by religion, demanded by religion and art, by, demanded by metaphysics and art. Knowledge of this metaphysic world is even more useless than the knowledge of the composition the composition of water to a sailor in danger of shipwreck. <laughs> Nietzsche doesn't recommend a sudden withdrawal from religion. So, metaphysical art is a useful tool to ease the withdrawal from religion. He thinks that art can be regarded as a substitute for religion. In other words, art enables us to enjoy Religion sentiments without the need to subscribe to any conceptual religious content. Art in secular age provides a platform through which people's religious habits can continue to exist. In this context, he mentioned music as a non-representational art which provides a home for religious feelings. Metaphysical art transports us to another world. It is not a super scientific, but a pre-scientific world, full of gods and demons. <clears throat> However, the metaphysical artists will be disappeared soon, and the future belongs to the scientific man. In the second volume of Human, All Too Human, he acknowledges the necessity of art. Art has the role of signposting the future. The question is, what kind of art can perform this function? 
According to Nietzsche, there are two kinds of arts, Apollonian and Eunosian art. The Eunosian or metaphysical art takes us away from the actuality of human existence and is completely out of favor. Whereas, Apollonian art is about reality. An Apollonian artist depicts only a selected reality. By selected reality, I mean the beautiful or an ideal one. The artist who can do that is Apollonian artist, like a sculptor or painter, who, is, who are the remodelers of life. When we talk about the creation of ideal images, we discuss transfiguration of re reality. In other words, Apollonian artist holds up a mirror and say, make yourself. So, his artwork is a model for people to recreate themselves. It is the reason that, re that the representational art is called signposting the future. To provide an example, Nietzsche was interested in classical art, especially Greek art. His idea is the same as Winkelmann, who talks about Laocoon and his sons. He says, this Laocoon is raising no dreadful cry. The pain of the body and the greatness of the soul are equally balanced. Laocoon suffers, but we should like to be able to bear in the manner of this great man. We can argue that great art construct the models of desirable personality types, then the forms then the forms which are symmetrical and harmonious are capable of expressing the collection of character traits which make the beautiful soul. So, art must be of service to life by helping to construct the future and artists are the remodelers of life. In the book, Das Spoke Zarathustra, the artist who can sign the future is called hyperhuman. Someone who destroys the past morality and creates a new one. We can say that the real artwork is the hyperhuman because he is the next model. He is the exact model that people must follow him. So, in Nietzsche's perspective, artist, artwork, and hyperhuman have the same identity. In conclusion, the real artist is the one who can create new moral norms and become a model of behavior for people. Nietzsche's definition of art and artist is different from the modern perspective of art in our world. Art has become something which doesn't have a relationship to real life and belongs to galleries and museums. So the question is, how can we use his ideas to make a connection between art and our lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arash. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Right. So you ready, Georgia? Yes. Okay, so this is Georgia, taught, uh, and the title of her paper is Taking Inspiration mm -hmm. from Kandinsky, Julian Beck's Scroll Painting for the Yellow Methuselah. Hey, can everyone hear me? Okay. So Julian Beck is well known for his role in the Living Theater, which he co-founded with his partner Judith Molina in 1947 in New York City. The Living Theater was a pacifist anarchist troupe who challenged the moral complacencies of a conservative world through politicized productions aimed at shocking audiences out of complacency. Beck and Molina were greatly influenced by Paul Goodman's discussions on pacifist anarchist morality, as he de-emphasized traditional associations of violence with anarchism, and promoted Russian anarchist Peter Kropotkin's notions of mutual aid and self-supporting communities. The Living Theater also worked with the French poet and playwright Antonin Artaud um, and his conception of a theater of cruelty, in which the theatrical fourth wall was dissolved to counteract complacency in the audience. Hoping to radicalize people through their plays, the Living Theater advocated for an anarchist society based on love, not violence. 
What is less known is that Beck was also a talented abstract expressionist painter who exhibited throughout the 1950s. Beck was drawn to the work of the abstract expressionists, particularly by the sense of mystery in their canvases, as well as the fact that many of the movement's leading artists were on the political left and separated themselves from the establishment. Abstract expressionism emerged as a response to the aftermath of World War II and the horrors of the atomic bomb. Abstraction allowed artists to create a vision that transcended the everyday, which they believed was necessary to transcend American society during a time of mass conformity, conservatism, and with the looming threat of nuclear annihilation. As an attempt to counteract the dehumanizing sphere of the capitalist mode of production, abstract expressionists sought inspiration from pre-industrial forms of art from Latin America and the Northwest Coast in order to accentuate the artisanal and the human aspect in the process of artistic production. Their handmade and automatist aesthetic signified autonomous individualism as exemplified in artisanal traditions and the anarchist belief in unmediated spontaneity. Rather than aiming to create a prepared and completed message, they wished to spark a new thought process in the viewer through an active contemplation and communication with the work. This desire for a larger project of radical social change within the creative imagination greatly attracted Beck. However, he ceased painting in the late 1950s to devote himself to the theater. Beck's return to painting is marked by the Yellow Methuselah, the Living Theater's adaptation of two plays from the World War I era, George Bernard Shaw's anti-war epic Back to the Methuselah from 1922, and Vasily Kandinsky's color-toned drama The Yellow Sound from 1909. The play was performed to great acclaim in Paris in 1982 and was brought to New York in 1984. Written and directed by Hanan Reznikov, this fusion narrated humanity's struggle against conflict and the possibility of realizing an anarchist society of peace and cooperation. As a backdrop for the performance, Beck created a 150-foot abstract scroll painting that moved on a crank mechanism for the duration of the play. Undertaking the set design, costumes, and lighting in the style of Kandinsky, Beck was inspired by the artist's unification of art and theater, his belief in the potential of art as a means of changing society, and his commitment to making people receptive to anarchism. Uh, Kandinsky's theatrical vision for the yellow sound ultimately never reached the stage during his lifetime. Printed in the Blue Rider Almanac in 1912, the play was comprised of imaginative characters, colors, and lights. Kandinsky believed the play would evoke the mystical unity that existed among all people. Taking inspiration from the bright colors, bold lines, and forms of Russian peasant art, Kandinsky was particularly, particularly drawn to the fact that their art showed little concern for a mimetic depiction of reality. Kandinsky's social and artistic anarchism complemented each other through the common goal of reconciling unity and diversity, as the anarchic society at the end of the play demonstrates a continual interchange of individuality and communality. Kandinsky believed in the anarchist vision of a revolution that not only would avoid capitalism, but would also transform values and regenerate humanity where all mankind would live in harmony and love. For Kandinsky, it was the artist, not the politician, who could powerfully evoke the emotions necessary for an anarchist transformation. The yellow sound represented the establishment of the stage as a source of spectacle, sound, and motion, demonstrating how Kandinsky was pushing the boundaries of the medium. Ultimately, his belief that art was key to changing life was a direct parallel to, Be to Beck's vision. In a 1982 essay, Beck outlined the impact of Kandinsky's work on his own practice. He referenced Kandinsky's book from 1912, The Spiritual in Art, which outlined the artist's aim to paint a concrete expression of the elements and forces that we cannot see, but which he felt were there. 
Beck explained that he felt the work, the content of Kandinsky's work was often ignored, disdained, or unperceived. Despite the fact that Kandinsky attempted to open our eyes to the invisible, Beck felt that the 20th century public continued only to see what it wanted to see, a non-message. But while Kandinsky's work did not represent the concrete world, it was, however, a depiction of invention, freedom, and motion. Beck went on to write, and I quote, in a century hot on meaningless, on stripping life of its ethical impulse, on substituting for that impulse the hollow valves of profit and power-oriented states and enterprises, in a century which has produced the most extravagant death-dealing devices in history, the work of Kandinsky has something deeply significant to say to us, because we can see by analyzing the way in which his work has been misunderstood, what is wrong with our thinking and our vision. Beck felt that Kandinsky's work was deliberately misunderstood. He further stated that the Yellow Methuselah was the living theater's attempt to emphasize what Shaw and Kandinsky were saying and, quote, to undo the 20th century preference for death over life. The play's fusion refers to the idea of a conscious evolution, that society can choose its own destiny through internal strength and cooperation. As an accompaniment to this message, the painting itself evolves, moves forward, and changes. The abstracted shapes and colors echo Kandinsky's goal to evoke the feelings and yearnings which would bring harmony that much closer. Um, Beck argued that abstract art stimulates the imagination and sets the imagination free, further stating that, quote, the act of freeing is anarchist. The theater was the living theater's arena to address fundamental social and psychological aspects of human beings. It was more than a place of entertainment. It was a place to agitate both the spectators and the performers' lives. In this context, the scroll painting ultimately becomes more activated and more than a backdrop. It served as a visual statement to further Beck's anarchist social agenda, of making people receptive to change and to think about new possibilities for the future. And I'll just conclude um, with a quote by Beck in which he regarded the role of the artist as such. Quote, in times of emergency such as these in which we are living, when we are looking for ways out of the trap, we naturally look to art as the expression of freedom and realize that to be useful, it must take a moral position to counteract the immoral culture. A position of strong statement of a social, political, and economic nature to face the issues and to confound them, to shed light on our darkness, to open our eyes and move us to effective action. I think that's the question that faces the artist today. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. What a great and relevant quotation to finish with. Right. Amina's uh, presentation is called Breaking Words. I mean, everyone can read it, but it's nice to say something. Breaking Words, an act of deconstruction to embrace the ephemerality of human life. Hello, this is Amina Sharmin. So um, the t uh, title of my talk is Breaking Words, an act of deconstruction to embrace the ephemerality of human life. Um, in this paper, I focus on activist artist Arhmayani Faisal, whom I met in person three months ago. She's a leading figure in the contemporary Indonesian art culture. Being one of the foremost female Indonesian activist artists, her reputation spans Southeast Asia and well beyond. Her powerful and provocative commentaries on social, political, environmental, and cultural issues make her globally recognized. She is also considered as a pioneer of performance art in Southeast Asia. Although she is internationally well known for her performance art, her works also incorporate various media such as painting, illustration, video, music, and dance. On March 13, 2019, Armani was invited to present a public talk at the University of Victoria, Canada, supported by the Orion Fund in Fine Arts, titled I Love You, Performing Art, Environment, Pluralism, Pluralism and Identity in the Southeast Asia. 
Um, she also attended a seminar conducted by Dr. Astro Wright, um, the Associate Professor of Art History and Visual Art Department at UV, especially, especially designed for the graduate student to give the opportunity to com communicate with her more um, intimately. I was privileged to participate in the talk. It was interesting to see how a committed artist simply shares her ideology and grabs the whole environment with her. Therefore, in this talk, I will include my personal experience along with my critical analysis of her artworks. Um, Arohmanu uh, was born in Banduang, the capital of Indonesian West Java province in 1961. Her father was a Muslim ulama and mother was a Javanese uh, Hindu Buddhist extraction. Being born in a mixed religious family, a dynamic, a dynamic syncretism of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and animism is evident in her artworks. My research focused on her art from the last decade of the 20th century into the early 21st century, a time of political turmoil due to the dictatorial rule of President Suharto and the shifting Indonesian political situation. The authoritarian government of Suharto and domestic political struggles after the post-Suharto period encouraged many Indonesian artists to engage with political and activist art, and Arhamayani is one of the pioneer and controversial artists among them. In this paper, I especially focus on her performance at Breaking Words. Breaking Words is considered one of her most provocative works in which she and the audience participants writing keywords that have importance or resonance to them on porcelain plates. Later on, she smashes the plates on the ground. In Japan 2004, it was presented for its very first time and has successfully been presented since then in different countries. For example, Indonesia, Australia, United States, Malaysia, Singapore, and Canada. This paper addresses how breaking words illustrate the ephemerality of human life and how Arhmayani engages with the socio-political phenomena within this performance. I argue that this art is informed by the concept of deconstruction. Moreover, it raises two important questions that need further consideration. Why deconstruction is important in contemporary phenomena and how she reconstructs. Additionally, it also leads to the discussion of how her work became more global and cosmopolitan after her residency in Australia in 1983. For the last eight years, the majority of her work has addressed the environmental issues in Tibet and beyond. Predominantly, she is a politically committed artist. I argue that she not only incorporated political issues, her art also demonstrates the notion of personal is political. Her works represents her personal experience of being a woman living in a colonized country and her upbringing with Muslim Javanese tradition. She breaks all the geopolitical boundaries and weaves the spiritual connection between nature and human life. On March 17, Arhmani performed her breaking works in Victoria, organized by Open Space, which is a nonprofit artisan center. She started performance by writing herself capitalism in a white dinner plate and invited the audience to write one word that deemed important to them. People expressed their emotion in various ways from a wide range of terms and ideologies, from racism, white supremacy, humanity, empathy, to simple words like food, justice, and truth were written on the plates. Some wrote in their native, lang uh, in their native language and some even doodled to express more. Here are some pictures of uh, the performance. This is me. I couldn't resist myself to share this photo <laughs> with you. I was fortunate to participate in the performance, so yeah. When all plates were leveled, she smashes them, throwing against a wall. The, um, the high-pitched noise of broken plates and impetus of the moment left the audience with awe. Symbolically, every important thing that matters to them were broken and gone. People's own language, broken. Hope and optimism broken. Stereotypes types broken. She ended uh, with a simple bow and a smile on her face. In the discussion she session, she specified that in human life, nothing is permanent in this world. She also urged that you got to do what you need to do in time, just like the Baal philosophers. Coming from Bangladesh, a South Asian country enriched Sufi Baal culture, I was surprised to see how Arhamani creates a spiritual relationship within and beyond Southeast Asia. Listening to her concept, I considered the famous quote of Fakir Lalon Shah in Bengali language, which is, 
সময় গেলে সাধন হবে না দ্যাট মিন্স ইফ দ্য টাইম পাসেস বাই দেয়ার উইল বি নো সেলফ অ্যাচিভমেন্ট অর স্পিরিচুয়াল এনলাইটমেন্ট ফার্দার মোর হার ইন্টেন্স অ্যাক্ট অফ ডিস্ট্রাকশন পজেসেস দ্য ডিসকোর্স অফ ডিকনস্ট্রাকশন অফ অল এক্সিস্টিং টেক্সচুয়াল লেভেলস অ্যান্ড স্টোরিও ট্রাইভস দ্যাট ড্রস বাউন্ডারিস বিটুইন কান্ট্রিজ কালচারস জেন্ডার অ্যান্ড ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল আইডেন্টিটিস She criticized the way we have been institutionalized in terms of concept, geography, politics, language, and so on. Thus, we need to consider asking ourselves what is natural and what is socially constructed. Capitalism, democracy, nationalism, feminism, education, what is natural? What is truth? What is justice stands for? The significance of breaking wars lies upon our present time while we are fighting in the name of geographical boundaries, religion, nationality, gender, and so on. Our money breaks all the levels and stereotypes and whips them all in one thread. I argue that deconstruction carries the opportunity of reconstructions, especially a country like Indonesia that went through the colonial and dictatorial period, additionally enriched with cross-culture and diverse tradition. In an informal con- uh, conversation to Armayani, I asked her how it feels to live in different places, as she has been living in Austria, China, and Indonesia. Does it uh, feel like you are living in a diaspora? With a beautiful smile on her face, she replied, no, I like living in all these places. But it is a nomadic life. I would say this nomadic life allows her to break the chain of identity, nationalism, and religion. Experiencing, di- experiencing different cultures and dogmas leads her to oppose the spiritual connection between human life and nature. Therefore, human life is more precious to her than any other identity. The question then becomes, what is her approach to reconstruction? Environmental issues in Tibetan Plateau region has been a particular focus of her, her, her work. Her active collaboration on site with Buddhist monks and villagers to foster greater environmental consciousness through an area of ongoing community project has also been supported by the government recently. Being a disciple of Dalai Lama and influenced by the great uh, Buddhist monk Atish Dipankar, perhaps working with communities, helping deprived people, and increasing consciousness become her approach of reconstruction. To conclude, I say Arahmayani is an artist, activist, and feminist who denies all the terms to define herself. She is a committed artist who values herself as a human being and part of nature. Last but not the least, living in Bangladesh, a small South Asian country that went through the colonial period, liberation war, and dictatorial state, similarly in Indonesia, I am familiar with the dilemma of political turmoil and how artists' responses towards sociopolitical injustice or inequality in South, contemporary South Asia. Therefore, this research can, research can further build a parallel bridge between South Asia and South Asia. Asian activist art. Moreover, my further research goal is to expand my knowledge to activist and resistant art from the global perspective and bring it into conservation. Thank you. Thank you. That was also a wonderful talk. And last but emphatically not least, we have Brian. Before I start, I'd really like to express my thanks. I can't tell you what an honor it is uh, to be here for the second year in a row, uh, to feel uh, so welcomed among such uh, fine scholars and my fellow students. And I want to f- uh, thank the Foundation, uh, and particularly, uh, of course, James uh, and Karun and especially Betty, who's really special. Uh, and also to Alan, without you, uh, none of us would be, none of us students would be here, so thank you. So, this is Giotto's fresco, The Raising of Lazarus, on the north wall of the arena that is the Scroveni Chapel in Padua, Italy, painted in 1303, Uh, between 1303 and 1305. And I want to draw your attention to the detail on uh, on the right-hand side, because what I'm going to talk about are the the two sisters. And they are, in this particular rendition, uh, in the foreground is Martha, and in the background, uh, almost completely hidden by her, is her sister, uh, Mary of Bethany. 
In all other representations from this period, including Giotto's own later representation of Assisi, Mary is placed before Martha. I believe that Giotto's unique reversal of the two sisters in the chapel was a deliberately intended by Giotto to visually broadcast the moral worthiness of its founder and owner, Enrico Scrivini. In particular, Enrico's uh, role as an exemplary Christian host who cared for both the earthly and spiritual needs of his guests. Additionally, this was a visual reminder for viewers of their own moral obligation to provide hospitality within the Christian understanding of what that meant. Uh, and for some reason, no art historian has actually uh, addressed this theme of hospitality. So this is new work and it's part of my dissertation. The Scrovini family were an upstart and extremely wealthy Paduan family who were heavily involved in money lending. Enrico's father, Rinaldo, uh, seems to have had a particularly unsavory reputation as a usurer and was prominently placed in hell by Dante in the Inferno, uh, as you can see here. <laughs> Enrico's acceptance of his inheritance of his father's wealth and his own involvement in money lending uh, both had a potential impact on his soul's fate, and this was a real source of angst and concern for Enrico, and in fact was his primary motivation for building and decorating the chapel. And this is the only known depiction of Enrico. Uh, kneeling before uh, the three Marys uh, presenting his chapel. As a privately owned family chapel attached to the Scroveni residence, the artistic program that Giotto painted was designed as one of its primary functions to portray specific intended messages about the chapel's patron as a moral and worthy Christian. And of course, the house has not existed since 1827, so uh, uh, no art historian, a uh, modern art historian, has, has been able to look at the chapel in context of the house. We now, however, thanks to Laura Jack, Dr. Laura Jacobus, have some reconstructions and we can do this. Uh, and that's also part of my dissertation, is to really look at the meaning of the chapel and its decoration in context of the fact that it was part of a private home and was privately owned. And this totally changes the dynamics of who would have viewed the frescoes and how they would have experienced those frescoes in context, in context of its owner. Scrovani's own moral worthiness was explicated both directly as here we see in the presentation of the chapel to the Virgin, and indirectly through various aspects of the narrative paintings uh, and the vice and virtue cycle in the chapel. Except on the Marian feast days when the chapel was filled with the greater Paduan public, most of the attendees at the chapel's daily services and thus viewers of the painted panels would have been Scrovani's family, uh, his household, and especially his guests. His moral stature as one who was generous with his hospitality was thus an important objective, I believe, for Scrovani to convey, and both the house and the chapel were helpful instruments in doing this. Above all else, the chapel was to be the means by which Enrico could ensure his presumed time in purgatory uh, and the excruciating punishment that he could expect in purgatory, perhaps for centuries, would be shortened. This would be achieved in good measure through the prayers of the many people who benefited from the chapel, not only through their own spiritual and moral renewal, but also through a reduction of their own time in purgatory because Enrico had solicited Pope uh, Benedict XI uh, for indulgences. So anyone who went to the chapel on those Marian feast days, at the feast days of the Virgin Mary, uh, received 140 days off their time in purgatory. <laughs> in a social culture, 
and this is Italian culture during this time period, of obligation and reciprocity, the viewers would automatically have included prayers for his prosperity and well-being while alive and his speedy entry into heaven after he died. The medieval period considered hospitality, that is the provision of shelter, food, and other basic needs, an absolutely central Christian practice and was a key issue in judging the moral worthiness of those who had resources. Jesus, in Matthew 25, not only equated providing hospitality to others with providing it to himself, but emphasized that the converse was also true, that eternal punishment was the portion of those who failed to provide it, as we can see here. Both Rinaldo and Enrico were renowned for their hospitality. Bernardino Scardone, 1478-1574, claimed that Rinaldo is, quote, praised by all writers as having been an extremely hospitable man. Zambono de Favasocchi, died in 1315, so he's a contemporary, mentions that Enrico often hosted the future Pope Benedict XI, who granted favors, including the indulgences to Enrico, in gratitude, quote, for the hospitality shown him. Enrico's many guests, whether his social superiors, equals, or subordinates, would have received earthly food in the house and heavenly food in the chapel. In his capacity as host, Enrico was thus catering to his guests' spiritual and physical needs and would have been the beneficiary of their gratitude. Thus, the house and chapel functioned as an integrated whole in Scrovani's role as host. The temporal and the spiritual were seamlessly conjoined. I believe that this theme of Christian hospitality was embedded in both content and placement in four of Giotto's arena panels with the overt objective of representing Enrico as a worthy Christian host. Let me emphasize, however, that all of Giotto's panels carry multiple layers of meaning and messages, and I'm only focusing on this one aspect, that of hospitality, and we'll only talk about one of these four panels, the raising of Lazarus. As noted at the beginning, depictions of the raising of Lazarus were a standard part of many narrative cycles about Jesus' life and ministry. The iconography around the placement of Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, always gives Mary visual and therefore theological precedence over Martha. Mary, who at this time was also conflated with Mary Magdalene, is always shown in a red cloak, and her sister Martha is always shown in a green or white cloak, and is placed behind her. This iconography was consistent with the gospel account of the two sisters, in which Jesus rebukes Martha when she complains to him that she was doing all the work of hosting, while Mary just sat around and listened to him. <laughs> Jesus pointedly says to uh, uh, Mary, uh, to Martha, that Mary has chosen the better portion, and therefore she took precedence. Moreover, uh, her con her, her um, uh, conjoining with Mary Magdalene, they confused the two and put them together, uh, uh, meant that she was automatically a much more important uh, figure historically, theologically, and allegorically. For some reason, only one art historian of the many who have, who, have, who have studied the Arena Chapel even seems to have noticed the fact that the sisters were reversed. And he... Uh, only commented on it to the extent to say Mary's been hidden because of her sinfulness. They, she was thought to be, in Mary Magdalene, she was thought to be a former prostitute. Uh, and so uh, this is, this is uh, Giotto's way of emphasizing her shame and penitence for her sinful ways. So for him, reversal is only about Mary and has nothing to do with Martha. I wish to provide an alternative explanation for Martha's placement that I maintain is more consistent with the overall context of Scrovani and Giotto's uh, um, decoration and use of the Arena Chapel. 
There seems to be general agreement that the source material for the content of Giotto's narrative panels was Jacobus Voragine, 1230 to 98, Golden Legend, a comprehensive com compilation of the most significant saints' lives and miracles. This was a standard reference source for preachers and artists, and most of the stories about particular saints would have been well known to both Scrovani and Giotto, as well as to the viewers of the chapel's paintings. Voragine's account of Martha, St. Martha, emphasizes her role as a hostess and hospitality provider. Voragine quotes her referring to Christ as her, quote, dear guest, and at the time of her death, Christ comes to her and says, quote, come, beloved hostess, and where I am, there you will be with me. You welcomed me into your house, I shall welcome you into my heaven, and for love of you, I shall li listen favorably to those who invoke you, end of quote. Moreover, nowhere in Voragine's lengthy discussion of Martha did he, does he even mention her being rebuked by Jesus or her playing second fiddle to her sister. So I believe that this unique representation of Martha was intended to highlight the provision of hospitality as a fundamental Christian virtue and the spiritual benefits to those who practiced it. In this instance, Enrico Scrovani. Thank you. Well, another four wonderful papers from the students, and uh, we've now got uh, 20 minutes or so for anyone to ask questions of any of the papers. Yes, uh, Nick's got to a fast start. So, Brian, thanks for that. Um, I was thinking of Luke 1042 the whole time where Jesus rebukes Martha for cleaning up the house while Mary's sitting there listening to his teachings, and he says, right, uh, one thing is needful. Mary hath chosen the good part or whatever. It's translated different ways. Um, and I was just wondering, I mean, there, there's a kind of maybe critical interpretation in putting Martha in the front, where um, as good as hospitality is, um, there's a sense in which, according to Luke 10, 42, you're wasting your time if you're spending too much on the hospitality when other things are more important, like having your soul saved by Jesus. Um, and I wonder if that's, I don't know if that has any traction with your, with your ways of thinking about this painting. I, I found it super illuminating and eloquently delivered. Um, and thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nick. Yeah. I, I mean, I would argue, sorry, thank you. Um, well, I would argue that it doesn't. I would argue, I would argue especially in light of the, uh, oh, I wish I could back up. Could, could somebody back up the slides? To the, to the other panels, uh, the Giotto panels. There. Uh, no, sorry, not these ones. Uh, uh, please, there we are. So I only dealt with one. I only dealt with one uh, panel. But in fact, when you look at the placement of the other panels, so what do the people see coming in? When they, they, the People forget that there was an entrance from the house. It's actually visible. It's the north. It's it, it's the north door, and you can still see the outline of the door. When they come in, they're looking. What they're looking at is the Last Supper. So they're looking again at a theme in which hospitality is embedded. And then when do they go out? What are they looking at? They're looking at Pentecost, in which the apostles are all gathered together. And they're actually sharing, the, 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 they're about to share a meal, just as the people leaving the chapel are about to share a meal as Scrovani's hosts. So I would say that there's no sense of criticism or a displacement of the importance of hospitality. Very good answer. Yes, Betty. Georgia, this question is for you, great paper. Um, the quote that you ended on, I'm just wondering about the time frame of that. Um, it was in 1982, 1982, so around the time that, well, when Beck was making this painting, and it was from an essay called Art and Anarchy. 
Mm-hmm. 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 Well, that, that sets the time frame much better, I think. Yeah, and on, the, on that note, I just want to say if anyone sees any connections between what I've said and some of those quotes and Jeffrey's work, I would love to hear some thoughts on that. Thank you. Dave. Thanks. I have a question for uh, Sharman, actually. Um, what a fascinating uh, piece of installation performance that was. I didn't quite know much about it until I saw, uh, I think, your well-chosen slides um, of this artist smashing these plates and the interactive nature of it. And and, uh, and I was taken by your uh, interpretation of it. Um, my language is smashed. Uh, Hope and optimism are smashed. And I wanted to know if you could maybe describe the performance a little bit more. Um, you know, did she show, particularly show the plates before she would smash them to remind the, the viewing audience of what word in this moment was being smashed and perhaps let the participant know my word is being smashed? Or did she just sort of indiscriminately smash them? Did she pause on any of them and maybe emphasize, I'm going to be slower with smashing hope? You know, because because you chose hope and optimism are smashed too. And when I looked at that population of uh, things you chose to uh, to suggest were smashed, um, it strikes me that this is a, a smashing of, of ideology. You know, you've got language, you've got hope, and so maybe false constructs was the broader theme, or was she trading on specific words that had uh, individual linguistic value? I'm going to smash uh, the word hate really fast, but I'm going to smash the word hope really slow, for example. So, could you tell us a little more about the performance? So basically what she did, uh, there was a table, um, including all the plates, white plates, and she wrote down capitalism and showed it to everyone. So when she did that, like I'm writing something and showing it to everyone what I did, so everyone was following that. What they were writing, they were showing the audience that what they wrote. And actually it was gathered on the table. Like when all the plates were done, then she started to smash them. And it was really intense, like, it is really energetic. She doesn't. She didn't care about the plates or no pause, no hope, no optimism, nothing. She was just smashing them in an intense act. So that is uh, something. And uh, this is interesting that when she was smashing, like I told you, she was not pausing for any words. She was just doing that without even noticing what word is broken. Four plates didn't break. And when she pulled that plates, there was two plates that was like mother and another was uh, maybe justice. And uh, there were other two places that I forget, but it was like something that we want, oh, white supremacy and racism. Didn't smash. No, so it was uh, like, it is coincidence I would say that, but there was two positive plates that didn't smash and two negative. And she then placed them that did things didn't smash, smash. So I think like there wasn't no place for it's good or bad. I'm, I'm only breaking the bad things. But here I would like to say like I saw, saw that most of the time he, she is writing capitalism. So I think she intend to break that term. Like she is into it, but you can control what audience like to wrote on because she did not tell them I'm gonna smash them. She just invited them, please write something that is honest to you that you seems important. So then she smashes them. So what audience have no idea. What did you write? I wrote in my own language in Bengali the word katatar, that means the geographical boundaries in no man's land. Because I knew that it is going to be smashed. So <laughs> That is why I wanted to break down. <laughs> yes, I was thinking about showing the video, but at it is ten minutes. I thought it's more than two and yeah. half minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm Reem. Thank you. I have a question from Arash. And we had a very long discussion last night as well, but I still want to <laughs> probe some questions to you. So my question is, you talk about new moral norms. From according to Nishe, what are moral norms? How do he define it? Or what are his standards of moral norms? And the second part of my question is that, as you suggested, that Nishe does not uh, does not believe in metaphysical ideas and concepts but the very fact that he suggested that there is some human hyperhuman who doesn't exist in reality but could be in the future so signposting the future 
So it's not actually in the real world. It's somewhere else out there. So the very idea of hyperhuman seems metaphysical to me. So at one point he's saying I'm denying it. At the other point he's suggesting the same thing. So there's a paradox if you can talk about it. Thank you. I would say that uh, about your first question that what is uh, his standards for hyperhuman, I would say that he thinks that uh, Christ in his time was hyperhuman. But the problem was that he believed to eternal truths. Because of that, uh, because he, uh, he believed in dynamic world, dynamic truths, not eternal one. So he thinks that we, can, uh, we cannot regard uh, Christ as hyperhuman because we have to new ourselves, recreate ourselves all the times, but Christ didn't do that. And about your second question, uh, that uh, it seems that uh, hyperhuman is another uh, metaphysical idea. I agree with you that uh, hu uh, that in Nietzsche's philosophy, hyperhuman is kind of metaf an, another metaphysical idea. Because of that, in his third and fourth phase of his philosophy, he is thinking just about our body, not about hyperhuman or mor morality. He's, he thinks that we, for example, he thinks about the beauty of sex in human life, not about hyperhuman. It is just about his second phase of philosophy, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy. Yes, Monk. Yeah, I had a question for Georgia. I, I was interested, you mentioned Paul Goodman in your discussion, and I'd like you to maybe elaborate on his importance for Beck and tell us a little bit more about who he is and why he was so crucial at the moment when Beck was forming his own, his own ideas. And, um, Alan actually has a wonderful paper <laughs> which goes into this and um, I don't know if I can elaborate too, too much on the spot here but basically he was key for introducing them to the ideas of, um, well, to pacifist anarchism which they were to translate into their practice um, and he really emphasized that the focal point of anarchism is a respect for the autonomy of all individuals. He really um, made that point. And um, his influence even, they adapted his play Faustina, because um, he was a playwright as well. And um, I believe Judith Molina met him first and then introduced Beck to his writings from there. Um, and by doing so, by becoming pacifist anarchists, as you said during this time, they made themselves marginal in America. I just have one more follow-up, and that was fascinating on Kandinsky's impact on Beck. That's amazing. And I was wondering about how Beck dealt with Kandinsky's theosophy. You know, there, there's anarchism, theosophy were merged in Kandinsky's thinking. And I was wondering if back how he responded to that spiritual dimension of what Kandinsky was writing and thinking about. Um, he basically felt that that spiritual dimension had been ignored and that his non-objective art, the public just saw that as a non-message in Beck's mind. Um, and he felt it was crucial, the spiritual aspect. And um, he, in this essay, talked about um, seeing Kandinsky's work as a teenager in New York at the Guggenheim and the impact that that had on him. Um, and obviously the fusion of the play itself, just so the actual play is a fusion of Kandinsky's The Yellow Sound. Um, and I did talk about, it's it, that play is a bit um, abstract itself, as I said, imaginative characters and colors and lights. It doesn't exactly follow um, a strict kind of narrative. Uh, so it is 
I, I wish I could show a video or something <laughs> to explain, but um, Kandinsky, before he was an artist, uh, actually was, um, he studied law, particularly um, peasant law, Russian peasant law. Um, and so, um, <coughs> specializing with dealing with lower classes. And um, yeah, Beck was just incredibly inspired by almost every aspect of, of Kandinsky. Mm -hmm. Brian, a quick question for me. Uh, one of the, 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 the one of the powerful impacts when you go into the Arena Chapel is the uh, amazing azurite blue backgrounds and, and ceiling. And I just wonder how uh, unusual was it for, for fresco cycles of that period to, to have so much blue in the background? Well, first of all, the, the blue was uh, the most expensive material. It was ground up uh, la, la, uh, lazuli. Um, and uh, so it was, it, it, it was, had already been used in uh, some of the uh, cathedrals um, that were being built in Italy, uh, but it's the earliest example we know of uh, within, a, within a home um, and, and the chapel. Uh, what is likely is that um, we unfortunately have uh, almost, almost no knowledge of what the decoration of the house was. But we do know from uh, close to contemporary sources, and I'm thinking of, of places like the uh, Palazzo de Vizzi in Florence and the Palazzo d'Avanzati in Prato, that where, uh, where they were hiring people to uh, do religious uh, um, uh, address in art directly in religious institutions, that they were also using them in the house. So the, the odds are, we, and we have some written descriptions from early travelers in the house saying how richly decorated it was, uh, but we only have one mention uh, of, a, um, uh, of, a, of a fresco, which was of the Virgin Mary. So uh, it's probably pretty early. I don't know of, uh, but, but a part of our problem is, is that uh, virtually all of these places, the ones we only have, we only have maybe three or four from this period that have survived. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that most of them, uh, if they didn't burn down, uh, during the Renaissance, they were all transformed and they were repainted. They, the, the, the Renaissance hated medieval art. Uh, and, and the house, what you saw in the house, uh, is actually... Uh, uh, a renaissance, uh, a dramatic renaissance reconstruction by the Foscari family. So, uh, but the fact that uh, uh, the blue used, uh, which is usually used in, in, in uh, um, uh, icons, in religious icons in churches for the robe of the Virgin, uh, it was almost always in blue, to put that on a, on a ceiling would have been really quite dramatic and a real statement, of course, of the wealth and therefore the piety uh, and Christian moral worthiness of the guy who paid for it. Uh, we could take one more question if, if there are any others. Well, what we, why don't we just have a round of applause for the four speakers.